Amen. So we have been looking uh, at an interesting, a different way of looking at subjects in the Bible this this month in June. And, and we've been looking at, for instance, last, uh, last or, uh, you know, we heard from my, my wonderful wife last week. But two weeks ago, we looked at uh, the other side of questions and how questions are so important. And we usually look at questions a certain way. But looking at questions in a different light or from a different angle is very important because we then start recognizing that questions aren't just things we need to be defensive or aware of or know how to answer. But we, as those who know, need to know how to answer, also need to be how, know how to ask the questions. It's interesting. Did you know that in the Bible, in the New Testament, Jesus asked 308 questions? But yet, in the New Testament, in the Gospels, he was asked by someone else 183 questions. Of those 130, or 183 questions, Jesus actually only directly answered eight of those questions. <laughs> I heard Robert Madu of Social Dallas in, in Dallas, Texas, a pastor of Social Dallas, uh, uh, saying... That whenever you go to Jesus, you know he's going to try teaching you. Or he's going to, you hate going to Jesus with questions sometimes because he's going to turn around and ask you a question back. <laughs> and, and it's so true, questions we need to know. Because when you're asked a question, Jesus knows when you are asked a question, it actually takes you deeper to the heart of the matter really does. It's like when Jesus was asked about, uh, uh, by the woman in the well, when uh, uh, the Samaritan woman at the well, and she's asking Jesus a question about how he worships, worship, worships and all of these th fun things, and he's like, where's your husband? Uh, I'm not married. You answered correctly. You've been married seven times, and the guy you're with isn't even your husband right now. He knew how to get to the heart of the matter, and immediately she said, I perceive you're a prophet. She needed to know that Jesus wasn't just some random Jew who was her enemy. She needed to recognize that Jesus knew what's up about her life. And Jesus knew how to ask questions that got to the heart of the matter. And so last two weeks ago, we were able to Look at that. And then we looked at the other side of obedience, which at times is difficult for us to understand because we kind of like immediate results to what we do. And we like to know why. Am I right? We like, no, 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 no. Why? What is your, what is your kid's favorite word when they hit uh, age six, five, six, six? Why? Because I said so. Do what I say. Why? Because I said so. Right? You know? Is what you, and you get frustrated by the question, why? We like to know why. You know why we get so frustrated when our kids ask us why? Because we're looking at a mirror. Because we do the exact same thing to God. <laughs> we like to know why. And so we got to the heart of that. Uh, at the beginning of this month, but today I'm really going to focus on another, another side of faith. And I want to look at faith differently because I'm not going to find faith. I'm not going to talk about how to live in faith. I'm not going to talk about all the general faith topics that we as people of faith are used to hearing. I'm going to talk about the other side of faith. And this isn't going to be up on the screen, but, but Ephesians chapter 2 verse uh, 8, excuse me, lost it there for a second, says it's by grace through faith, or it's by faith through grace, there it is, uh, that you're saved, not of works, lest any man should boast, right? We see, though, that the other side of faith is grace, now abides faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. The other side of faith is love. 
And so we see that maybe there's another side besides just grace and love to faith. Maybe we're going to find out the answer to that in the book of Galatians. So turn with me, if you would, to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. It says this. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Now, question, has he redeemed everyone? Y'all know me. I was a youth pastor for 18 years. When I ask a question and I look at you and I put my mic down, I'm expecting an answer. I'm used to like junior hires just yelling at me randomly in the middle of my messages. So if I don't get that once in a while, I kind of like have withdrawal syndrome. So <laughs> is everybody redeemed? Yes or no? He's redeemed us. Is that everyone in the world? The other side of faith is redemption. But to access redemption requires faith. See, the grace of God was shed abroad in all men's hearts. See, it's the will of God that all men be saved. All men, the Bible says, might know him. All men. But the access point is faith. And so we see that this redemption from the curse of the law is accessed by faith. He redeemed us from the curse of the law. What was the curse of the law? We're going to get to that at the end of my message. But we have been, before I go into this, let me ask you, who in here remembers their Jesus moment, we'll call it? This the moment that you, re, you remember when you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That moment when you had that just, oh, Jesus moment. That come to Jesus moment. I remember it vividly. I remember it so vividly. And, and why do we call it a come to Jesus moment or that moment, that, that experience, that prayer? Did, now, my question, here, you remember, and keep it in your mind. Did it take a long, drawn-out process? Did you have to say an incantation 27 times, turn around in a circle 52 times, and then spin on your head once? No. How did you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? By faith. The Bible says in Romans, and it, it's an interesting model. If you're ever wanting to know how, well, I've told people about Jesus, but now what do I do? They, they want Jesus, but I don't know how to, I don't know what to do there, right? Who's ever had that moment where you're just like, somebody's just coming to you, I just need Jesus. I've had it actually quite a few times. And I was stumped the first few times. Uh, like, go pray or something, right? And you want to you wanna tell people. The Bible talks about it in Romans chapter 8. In fact, it's called the Romans Road. You can Google it. Just Google the Romans Road. It'll take you from Romans chapter 6 all the way through 10. And the Romans Road, it says a very simple, how do people get saved? They believe. They believe that Jesus is who he said he was. That he is the Son of God. That God raised him from the dead after three days. And they confess with their mouth that he is Lord. That's it. It's not long and it's not drawn out. I am so thankful for a God who wants relationship. And it's as simple as, will you be my boyfriend? Will you be my girlfriend? You want to go on a date with me? <laughs> right? And it's almost awkward. I mean, who remembers the first time they asked a boy or a girl, come on, girls, you, you, I know there's some of you who's like forward and your mama was like, you're too forwarding, but you still asked that boy out. I, come on, any of you, is there any? No, no girl in here. Christina, you better raise your hand. <laughs> I could tell you. So 
uh, so this is how we actually went on, I think, our first official date. It was a Wednesday night service. We're in Bible college. And it's after service. I'm talking to my, what did we call them back then? My homies. I was talking to my, no, it was homeboys back then. My homeboys. Right? And, and <laughs> come on, I'm from California. And I'm talking to my homies. I still call them homies. And Christina comes up behind me. And you know my wife. She comes up and just taps me on the shoulder. She's like, you coming or what? You did too. Oh, the accent. Okay, I can't do a Canadian accent. Remember me in accents. Like every accent, I could be trying a French accent. Next thing you know, I'm a Scottish Russian. I don't know how every accent ends up a mix between a Russian and a Scotsman. And, and I mix the two, and it becomes this garbled accent. I don't know how it happens. It happens every time. So that was my Canadian accent. If you, <laughs> And so, uh, oh, that accent. Yeah. The, all right, yeah. And so she comes up, and she does. She has such, she was 25, and so she was full of attitude. Were you 23? I guess we were, t- oh, wow, it was, yeah, it was earlier than that. Just, she was 23. And she said, are you, are you coming or what? And I turn and look at her. I'm like, whoa, she got fire. Marry me now in Jesus. No. <laughs> Honey cometh. <laughs> right? Uh, Woman, thou art loosed from your singleness. <laughs> and I did not say any of those things. I was not that confident. Uh, and I turn and look at her. And in, in the moment of uncharacteristic confidence, I said, no, but I'm going to get coffee if you want to come with me. (laughs) Every girl in here just went, woo. (laughs) Uncharacteristically, I found some kind of supernatural confidence from Jesus. I mean, David jumped over a wall, Samson ripped down a gate, and I asked my wife out on a date. And, and it's been smooth sailing ever since. No, it hasn't. <laughs> but that's how it happened. She had confidence to ask me out. We, I don't even know where I was going with that. Dear Jesus, help me. <laughs> I don't even know where I'm at my word. Um, but it wasn't a long, drawn-out process. When we asked each other out, it was... As smooth and as confident as that. Just simple. It's the same thing with Jesus. We don't have to grab a rosary. We don't have to go get baptized. We don't have to go wash in the Jordan River. We don't have to do any of these things. We have to just believe, have faith, that Jesus is who he said he is. And then say, Jesus, you're my Lord. You're my Savior. In that moment is the moment when the supernatural collides with the natural and God changes us and adopts us into his family. See, we were saved from sin by Jesus when we believed in him and on him. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, it says, by becoming a curse for us. We access that redemption when we believe. Let's go back a couple verses. Go to Galatians chapter 3, verse 2. Let's start at the beginning now. Paul, speaking to the churches in the region of Galatia, said this to the churches. Let me ask you only this. Started out with a question. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law? Stop there for a minute. Did you receive God's salvation By works of the flesh. Did you receive God's gift by an act, by 27 Hail Marys, or dipping yourself in the Jordan River seven times like Naaman did? No. How did you receive God's gift? Or did you receive it by hearing with faith? When we hear truth, Our heart can recognize it. Not just any truth. I'm not talking about two plus two equals five. Right? Your mind immediately, naturally goes, nope, that's wrong. 
But when I tell you that John 3.16, when I tell you that Galatians 3, when I tell you that Romans 8.10, when I tell you what Jesus said, what the Bible says, our heart recognizes it. Why? Because God created us all to be able to discern his voice, to hear his voice, to know his voice. His voice will always tell us the truth. And when we hear it, when we hear and we mix what we hear with faith, we can receive the redemption that has, he has for us. So my first point tonight <laughs> is that God has made us people of faith. The other side of faith, not just love, not just grace, not just redemption, is that we're not just people that believe, but he's, we are people of the faith. God has made us people of faith. See, faith in God's grace, which is his undeserved, unmerited goodness towards us, is what ultimately is the most important aspect of our redemption. We love him because we first lo he first loved us. We heard about his love. We wanted his love because we never heard of any kind of love that's completely without any strings. And it, it's, it, it, it's all-encompassing where it's unmarried. I mean, I don't have to do anything. Do you know what I've done, Jesus? And he still loves me? When we hear about that, it, it, it just stirs something in us to be able to love him back. Go down to uh, Galatians 3, 5. So many of us, we try to win God's favor. And we think, oh no, his love isn't free. His love isn't all-encompassing. His love's got strings attached to it. And so we try to do works. We try to do, you know... Seven dips in the Jordan and turn around 17 times and maybe get a whip and whip ourselves like they used to do back in the old dark ages, right? You get a flail. Who, who owns a flail? Anybody? Okay, I was just checking. Tom, I believe it. Yeah, but we, we, we try to do things to win God's favor and we don't recognize that God's favor is already there. And it doesn't have anything to do with what you've done. His redemption, his grace, his goodness, his love is there. And you don't have to do anything for it. You just have to receive it. But this is what Galatians 3, 5 says. Does he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do so by the works of the law? You can put good works. You can put religious acts. You could put how many marathons you've run, how many homeless people you've fed, how much tithe you've given, right? How many times you go to church in a year. Does he do it by all of those works or by the hearing of faith? We cannot underestimate the power of connecting God's grace into our lives by faith. His grace is what brings his power to us, but it cannot have any effect in our life unless we connect by reaching out to it in faith. We, I've, I've been reading recently, rereading Christ the Healer by F.F. F. Bosworth. Great book to periodically go through. It's actually been a while since I've read it. And he, in one section of his book, he said, how can you... <clears throat> Even though you believe in God's healing power, how can you, even though trying to connect your faith to it, by believe God to drive out one work of the devil when you've got the rest of your life living for the devil? He's talking to believers here. 
And we, re- we want to ask the question, Lord, why is my life so hard? Your, it, your grace is all-encompassing. Your favor is here. I believe in the power of God, but yet I'm not seeing any of it in work in my life. What's going on? I said, hey, hey, yeah, yeah, hey, yeah, yeah, I said, yeah, what's going on? Right? We sing that to God. Right? I'm sorry about my bad 80s music. It, it does happen. Periodically. Actually, all the time. At least once a week. <laughs> and we, we want to yell at God... And blame him because we're not seeing his grace or his power, his favor, his all goodness working in our lives. We get mad at him and we want to blame him. Well, sometimes we just don't know why and we're like, God. And we never actually think to go and ask him, Lord, what's going on? We want to say what's going on, but we're doing it sarcastically. Like, right, God, your fault. And F.F. F. Bosworth said this, it's never God's fault. God put it all out here a long time ago. It's never changed. It's never lost power. It's never lost its provision, right? It's never gone away. It's never diminished. It's always been here, always, since he gave his spirit to the church. He said, "Me, this, you know why Jesus said it was better that he go away? Think about this. We're, we always like to attribute Jesus. Man, Jesus laid hands on the sick. How awesome would it be for Jesus to lay hands on me? Right? Think about that. Man, if I could just rub shoulders, it would be like the Apostle John and just lounge on Jesus. I mean, that would be awesome. Right? But Jesus said it this way. He said it's to your advantage that I go away. Why? Oh, because he's sending his spirit. Okay. Jesus is the head of the body, right? The head of the church. We are his body. So that means we are his feet. He has dominion over the devil. And so therefore, we are connected to the head because we're his body. Now listen to this. Jesus, when he went up to heaven, was suddenly completely glorified back to his original state. Why was it better? Because they, when he was on earth, got a touch from man God. God become flesh and dwelt among us. God's power was working through Jesus like it worked through you and me. We have hope that we can lay hands on the sick and they will recover because Jesus was just like you and me when he was here on the earth. But when Jesus was glorified, when Jesus went to heaven... And Jesus never disconnected from you and I. So now the glorified Jesus is now connected. So when we want to say, oh, if Jesus could have just touched us, we could have been back then. No, Jesus is touching us now, and he is fully glorified. Nothing hidden, nothing held back, nothing veiled. It's better that Jesus is in heaven now because we have it better because now we have the glorified God living in us. It's better. We have it better than Peter, John, Bartholomew, Nathaniel, Judas, not Iscariot, that guy. (laughs) I'd go change my name, Judas. (laughs) It's unfortunate that you're named Judas. We had it better than them when they were with Jesus. But it takes faith to access the glorified power of God in us. It takes faith. It takes faith, a belief that what he said in the Bible is actually real. We like to quote it. We like to talk about it, but do we live it? Do we live it? Do we do what it takes to walk out in faith? 
or do we only do, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah that's cool. We tow it. We like to test the waters. Yeah. Right? And we never want to just go all in. I had a, one of my mentors, Jim Hawkett, and he would say this. Why is it that a man who murdered his brother heard the audible voice of God and I never have? Why is it that Cain, the brother killer, can hear the audible voice of God and I never have? That's just a biblical story, reverend. It didn't actually happen. <laughs> All right, let's, let's just take the Bible, Jesus, everything, and just throw it in the trash. Cain didn't happen. Jesus didn't happen. It's as simple as it gets. Why, though? Cain was used to living his entire life hearing the voice of God. He was used to it. Well, it's not that far from Eden where God walked with Adam, his dad. Uh-huh, but what's that got to do with Cain? They, through Adam's failure, got kicked out. It didn't mean that they stopped hearing from God, though. And Cain, who was born in sin now, can hear God talk to him like a friend. You know why? From a young age, he heard his father talking to God like a friend. And so he knew if his daddy could do it, I can do it. And he did. Even after he murdered his own brother. Doesn't that disqualify someone from hearing the voice of God? Apparently not. Apparently not. <laughs> How is it that we expect to get the same results of Jesus, yet we won't live like him? Jesus said, you are my disciples if you do whatever I command you to do. I don't command, did Jesus ever tell us to go to church? Anyone? No. So why do we attribute our relationship and our obedience to God by our church attendance? I'm not going to drop the mic, don't worry. <laughs> I'd have to buy a new one. <laughs> hey, wait. <laughs> no. Jesus' commandments was to be the church. You are the ecclesia, the ecclesia, the gathered ones, those who are gathered in my name. You are to be the church was Jesus' commandment, not go to church. Be the church everywhere you go. It was Paul who said, don't forsake getting together. Don't quit church. That was Paul saying it. Saying because if you quit church, eventually you're going to stop being the church out there. Because you got nobody to encourage you. That's why Paul said don't stop going to church. Or, yeah, don't stop going. Yeah. <laughs> because we stop being the church eventually when we're by ourselves. The gathered ones means there's a gathering together in his name. But yet, we don't understand that faith without works is dead. But Pastor Josh, you just told me it's not by f works. No, you're right. Your works don't lead to faith. It's faith that leads to works. Faith has to have action. If you're not acting on what you believe, if we're not acting, if we're not being obedient to what Jesus said to lay hands on Pastor Deb, then there's no action to our faith. If, if we're not going out and clothing the homeless, then we're not acting out what we believe. The other side of faith is obedience. The other side of faith is works. And we don't talk about the dedication to work that the Bible talks about enough. 
you and I are mandated by Jesus himself to be disciples, not Christians. They weren't called Christians until Jesus was dead for about 20 years. They were called followers of the way, followers of that Nazarene fellow, and usually other names that nobody likes to mention and it's not appropriate for church. <laughs> we were mandated to be disciples, not Christians, not churchgoers, even though it's important to be, go to church. We are mandated to be disciples who follow Jesus' commandments. You want to know why it's not working in your life? Are you a disciple? The other side of faith is discipleship. See, I have a habit of reading the Word. I have a habit of thinking about what the Bible says because I've spent... 25 years of every day making this habit work in my life. And so I constantly am thinking about what the Bible says. Constantly just thinking about it. Because I've put more of that in me than anything else. Anything else. Now, I wasn't feeling well this last week, and I didn't, I was putting other things in. That I sh <laughs> Thank you, my wife, for for encouraging me to <laughs> sometimes when you're just not feeling well you just want to write netflix and chill yes i said that at church <laughs> but sometimes what are you putting in you it's not just about putting it in you it's acting on what the bible says to do that's what it's all about you want to know how to walk in what god said would happen, then act on what he said to do. Yeah, that's all I got. Just like Jesus, his mom said, like I say, at least three times a month, when they were at the wedding and Jesus was chilling with his disciples, enjoying the party, drinking Jesus juice, eating those burritos, and they ran out of wine, and Jesus' mother came and said, Jesus, they got no wine. And Jesus is like, you really want me to do this now? She turned to the servants, the workers at the wedding, and she said this thing that I will say in closing. Whatever he says to you to do, do it. When we are obedient to what he says to do, that's faith. When we are obedient to do what he says to do, we'll see water turned into wine. That's what faith does. Father, we thank you that you are the one that does it. It's not by our religious faith. No. It's not by how many times we quote your scripture. It's not about how many times we do anything. It's about simply what true faith is and does. James said it this way, Lord. You show me my, your faith by what you say. I'll show you by my faith by what I do. I pray, Lord, that today we would be doers of what we believe, of what you said and that as we walk out what you commanded us to do, we would see the other side of faith, what is good fruit, which is results, which is your life represented here in this earth, the fullness of God in action. And so, Lord, in this place and in this time, I just want to say... I'm sorry if I haven't acted in faith.
If I haven't acted out what you've asked me to do, and I've just done things religiously, I've just done things because it's what is expected of me, if I've done things just because, or just not even cared, I pray, Lord, that I would be an active disciple of Jesus, and that I would be a man that's marked by faith, marked by an action, not just a man marked by what I believe, but a man marked by doing what Jesus commanded. And I pray, Lord, that that would be our heart's cry today. It would be our desire just to be a disciple, just to be a follower and a doer of Jesus' word. And I pray, Lord, we would see great change because we're actually not just towing the issue. We're saying, I'm all in. I'm all in. I'm all in. I heard it at our graduation on Friday, Lord, the commencement speech. He said that if everybody is coming out of the closet, why are we staying in? I pray, Lord, that we would stop hiding. And we would stand for the power of God. And we would come out of hiding. We would come out from straddling the fence. We would come away from just towing the line. And we would be all in for Jesus. And when we do... <laughs> There would be freedom. There would be joy. There would be great change. And people would discover the life, love, and power of Jesus because we stopped towing the line and jumped all in. I pray that your power would help us. Your grace would be upon us. And our faith would mark us. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.